the way we develop shows um, often is that we kind of look at what's not on television and what ought to be and what we as, you know, people living lives are thinking about and what's, you know, what we'd like to see on television. We kind of like start as audience and not as producers. And so um, what wasn't on at the time was anything about a working mother. Working mothers were part of other shows that were really about the guy, you know, and the wife was an adjunct to the thing and she might or might not have a job. But there was no show about the absurdity and really the, the prevalence of the phenomenon of the working mom in America, you know, and, and it had, in 1988, there was something like 85% of households in America, uh, including a, a full-time working mother. Or, um, so it was, and, and, you know, it still continues to this day, that it's a phenomenon that was relatively, you know, recent at the time, that it had been building up, the percentages had been building up, until America was just full of these households where the mother was working eight hours or so, a day and coming home and working another eight to do the kids and the house and the thing because nothing had changed really at home. Nobody was doing what the woman used to do. She was just doing eight hours of something else as well now. So to talk about that phenomenon was something that was, you know, near and dear to my heart and, and uh, we, all, we thought that it was, and Tommy, because we, we knew we needed a loud and interesting and unique and in your face kind of presence um, to take it to the more outrageous end of the spectrum. Tommy actually suggested that this comedian that we had seen on The Tonight Show that we thought was just very funny, that we should take a chance on her actually being the center of the show. Even though she was not an actress, and I don't think anyone would say she ever became a great actress, but she had such a uh, distinct voice that we said, well, this is a lot better than casting the usual suspects. The usual suspects. So we just surrounded her with terrific actors. We just surrounded her with the best actors we could possibly find. I mean, they were fabulous. You know, Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman, um, Estelle Parsons for, you know, some of those episodes. Fabulous cast. Um, we, we've learned something which may not be so uh, obvious, which is that as strong as Bill Cosby was, that show worked in large part because he had this incredible ensemble to play off of. And the same thing was true of Roseanne. People people generally directed their their comments about the star power of, of, of Roseanne or the star power of, uh, of Bill Cosby, but without John Goodman. And there's a story which was that we, uh, Karen Mandebach had seen John Goodman in a, in, I guess, in, a, in, a, in a, an opera, right? Or Shakespeare. I think it was. Maybe it was Shakespeare, but she'd seen this actor. And we were looking for a long time for who could play Roseanne's husband. It was a critical role because if he liked her, some of her acerbic uh, attitude about uh, raising children would be softened a bit. And we needed to have somebody be as strong as Roseanne. And we found him. We adored him. He did a screen test with, uh, with uh, Roseanne. But there was a problem about his schedule. And the network um, felt very strongly. They wanted the show immediately. They wanted it in, its, in a great time period. And we had to turn down a, a, a wonderful time period for that show because John Goodman wasn't available. And it was a great lesson for us because it, it, it taught us again that they've got their own demands, the networks, and they've got their own schedules. But we would rather get it right and, and not, and not uh, sort of screw it up because you've got only one chance with the audience. And so we pushed the show back until... Goodman was available, and and uh, and when it went on the air, you know, it was in in large part due to his acting that made Roseanne so special.